Hi boys and girls, this is Mrs. P. I'm back with A Long Walk to Water based on a true story about um, the boys in Sudan who had to walk to Ethiopia. And it was, a, it was just a horrible thing. And if you haven't paid attention, then go back to the first chapter and, and start over because this is, it's a true story. Or it's based on a true story. And these things are happening in the world, or they have been. And we have to learn from past mistakes, so it's an important thing. So here we are, Chapter 12, Southern Sudan in 2009. An iron giraffe, a red giraffe that made very loud noises. The giraffe was a tall drill that had been brought to the village by two men who had visited earlier. They had returned with a crew of ten more men in two trucks, one hauling the giraffe drill along with other mysterious equipment and the other loaded with plastic pipe. Meanwhile, the land was still be being cleared. Naya's mother tied the baby on her back and walked with several other women to a place between the village and the pond. They collected piles of rocks and stones and tied them up into bundles using sturdy cloth. They balanced the bundle, bundles on their heads, walked back to the drilling site, and emptied the rocks onto the ground. Other villagers, using tools borrowed from the visitors, pounded the rocks to break them up into gravel. Many loads of gravel would be needed. Maya didn't, or Naya didn't know why. The piles of gravel grew larger each day. <clears throat> the clangor of machinery and hammer greeted Naya each time she returned from the pond unfamiliar noises that mingled with the voices of men shouting and women singing. It was the sound of people working hard together, but it did not sound at all like water. Itang Refugee Camp, Ethiopia, 1985. Mother, mother, please. Salva opened his mouth to call out again, but the words did not come. Instead, he closed his mouth, lowered his head, and turned away. The woman in the orange headscarf was not his mother. He knew this for certain, even though she was still far away and he had not seen her face. Uncle's words came back to him. The village of Lone Arik was attacked, burned. Few people survived. No one knows where they are now. In the moment before calling out to the woman a second time, Salva realized what Uncle had truly meant. Something Salva had known in his heart for a long time. His family was gone. They had been killed by bullets or bombs, starvation or sickness. It didn't matter how. What mattered was that Salvo was on his own now. He felt as though he were standing on the edge of a giant hole, a hole filled with the black despair of nothingness. I'm alone now. I am all that is left of my family. His father, who had sent Salvo to school, brought him treats like mangoes, trusted him to take care of the herd. His mother, always ready with food and milk and a soft hand to stroke Salva's head. His brothers and sisters, whom he had laughed with and played with and looked after, he would never see them again. How can I go on without them? But how can I not go on? They would want me to survive, to grow up and make something of my life, to honor their memories. What was it Uncle had said during that first terrible day in the desert? Do you see that group of bushes? You need only to walk as far as those bushes. Uncle had helped him get through the desert that way, bit by bit, one step at a time. Perhaps, perhaps Salva could get through life at the camp in the same way. I need only to get through the rest of this day, he told himself. This day and no other. If someone had told Salva that he would live in the camp for six years, he would never have believed it. Six years later, July 1991. They're going to close the camp. Everyone will have to leave. Well, that's impossible. Where will we go? That's what they're saying. Not just this camp, all of them. The rumors skidded around the camp. Everyone was uneasy. As the days went by, the uneasiness grew into fear. Salva was almost 17 years old now. A young man, he tried to learn what he could about the rumors about by talk, talking to the aid workers in the camp. They told him that the Ethiopian government was near collapse. The refugee camps were run by foreign aid groups and 
but it was the only, but it was the government that permitted them to operate. If the government fell, what would the new rulers do about the camps? When that question was answered, no one was ready. One rainy morning, as Salva walked towards the school tent, long lines of trucks were arriving. Masses of armed soldiers poured out of the trucks and ordered everyone to leave. The orders were not just to leave the camp, but to leave Ethiopia. Immediately there was chaos. It was as if the people ceased to be people and instead became an enormous herd of panicked, stampeding, two-legged creatures. Salva was caught up in the surge. His feet barely touched the ground as he was swept along by the crowd of thousands of people running and screaming. The rain, which was falling in torrents, added to the uproar. The soldiers fired their guns into the air and chased the people away from the camp. But once they were beyond the area surrounding the camp, the soldiers continued to drive them onward, shouting and shooting. And as he dashed ahead, Salva heard snatches of talk. The river, they're chasing us towards the river. Salva knew which river they meant. The, I'm not sure if it's Gilo River. Okay, or Gilo River. The Gilo River, which was along the border between Ethiopia and Sudan. They are driving us back to Sudan, Salva thought. They will force us to cross the river. It was the rainy season. Swollen by the rains, the Gilo's current would be merciless. And the Gilo River was well known for something else, too. Crocodiles. We're going to try to read one more. Chapter 13. Southern Sudan, 2009. Naya thought it was funny. You had to have water to find water. Water had to be flowing constantly into the borehole to keep the drill running smoothly. The crew drove to, drove to the pond and back several times a day. The pond water was piped into what looked like a giant plastic bag, a bag big enough to fill the entire bed of the truck. The bag sprang a leak. The leak had to be patched. The patch sprang a leak. The crew patched the patch. Then the bag sprang another leak. The drilling could not go on. The drilling crew was, was discouraged by the leaks. They wanted to stop working, but their boss kept going. All the workers wore the same blue coveralls still. Naya could tell who was the boss. He was one of the two men who had first come to the village. The other man seemed to be his main assistant. The boss would encourage the workers and laugh and joke with them. If that didn't work, he would talk to them earnestly and try to persuade them. And if that didn't work, he would get angry. He didn't get angry very often. He kept working and kept the others working too. They patched the bag again, and the drilling went on. Ethiopia, Ethiopia Sudan, Kenya, 1991-92. Hundreds of people lined the riverbank. The soldiers were forcing some of them into the water, prodding them with their rifle butts, shooting into the air. Other people, afraid of the soldiers and their guns, were leaping into the water on their own. They were immediately swept downstream by the powerful current. As Salva crouched on the bank and watched, a young man near him plunged into the water. The current carried him swiftly downstream, but he was also making a little progress across the river. Then Salva saw the telltale flick of a crocodile's tail as it flopped into the water near the young man. Moments later, the man's head jerked oddly. Once, twice, his mouth was open. Perhaps he was screaming. Salva couldn't hear him over the din of the crowd and the rain. A moment later, the man was pulled under, and a cloud of red stained the water. The rain was still pouring down, and now bullets were pouring down as well. The soldiers started shooting into the river, aiming their guns at the people who were trying to get across. Why? Why are they shooting at us? Salva had no choice. He jumped into the water and began to swim. A boy next to him grabbed him around the neck to clung and clung to him tightly. Salva was forced under the surface without time to take more than a quick shallow breath. Salva struggled, kicking, clawing. He's holding on to me too hard. I can't air, no air left. Suddenly the boy's grip loosened and Salva launched himself upwards. He threw his head back and took a huge gulp of air. 
For a few minutes, he could do nothing but gasp and choke. And when his vision cleared, he saw why the boy had let go. He was floating with his head down, blood streaming from a bullet hole in the back of his neck. Stunned, Salva realized that being forced under the water had probably saved his life. But there was no time to marvel over this. More crocodiles were launching themselves off the banks. The rain, the mad current, the bullets, the crocodiles, the welter of arms and legs, the screams, the blood. He had to get across somehow. Salva did not know how long he was in the water. It felt like hours. It felt like years. And when at last the tips of his toes touched mud, he forced his limbs to make swimming motions one last time. He crawled onto the riverbank and collapsed, and then he lay there in the mud, choking and sobbing for breath. Later, he would learn that at least a thousand people had died trying to cross the river that day, drowned or shot or attacked by crocodiles. How was it that he was not one of the thousand? Why was he one of the lucky ones? The walking began again. Walking, but to where? No one knew anything for sure. Where was Salva supposed to go? Not home. There's still war everywhere in Sudan. Not back to Ethiopia, the soldiers would shoot us. Kenya, there's supposed to be refugee camps in Kenya. And Salva made up his mind he would walk south to Kenya. He did not know what he would find once he got there, but it seemed to be his best choice. Crowds of other boys followed him. Nobody talked about it, but by the end of the first day, Salva had become the leader of a group of about 1,500 boys. Some were as young as five years old. Those smallest boys reminded Salva of his brother Kual. But then he had an astonishing thought. Wall isn't that age anymore. He's a teenager now. And Salva found that he could only think of his brothers and sisters as they were when he had last seen them, not as they would be now. They were traveling through a part of Sudan still plagued by war. The fighting and bombing were worse during the day, so Salva decided that the group should hide when the sun shone and do their walking at night. But in the darkness, it was hard to be sure they were headed in the right direction. Sometimes the boys traveled for days only to realize that they had gone in a huge circle. This happened so many times that Salva lost count. They met other groups of boys, all walking south. Every group had stories of terrible peril. Boys who had been hurt or killed by bullets or bombs, attacked by wild animals, or left behind because they were too weak or too sick to keep up. When Salva heard the stories, he thought of Mariel. He felt his determination growing as it had in the days after his uncle's death. I will get us safely to Kenya, he thought, no matter how hard it is. He organized the group, giving everyone a job. Scavenge for food, collect firewood, stand guard while the group slept. Whatever food or water they found was shared equally among all of them. When the smaller boys grew too tired to walk, the older boys took turns carrying them on their backs. There were times when some of the boys did not want to do their share of the work, and Salva would talk to them, encourage them, coax them, and persuade them. Once in a while, he had to speak sternly or even shout, but he tried not to do this often. It was as if Salva's family were helping him, even though they were not there. He remembered how he had looked after his little brother, Kual, but he also knew what it felt like to have to listen to the older ones, Arik and Ring, and he could recall the gentleness of his sisters, the strength of his father, the care of his mother, and most of all, he remembered how Uncle had encouraged him in the desert. One step at a time, one day at a time, just today, just this day to get through. Salva told himself this every day. He told the boys in the group, too. And when one day at a time, or and one day at a time, the group made its way to Kenya. More than 1,200 boys arrived safely. It took them a year and a half. And we'll stop here and read chapter 14 next week. A year and a 